Hello and welcome to the Spiked Podcast. I'm Fraser Myers and with me this week we have Spiked columnist Ella Whelan. Hi. And filling in for Tom Slater, we have GB News presenter Anea Follerin Iman. Hey. Coming up on the show, the government's COVID car crash, the botched withdrawal from Afghanistan, the attempt to cancel Rod Liddle, and the boundless entitlement of Hillary Clinton. So the government has had an absolute nightmare on the COVID front, I think it's fair to say. First of all, there's been these new revelations about a possible party at Downing Street and a leaked video to boot. And there's also been the announcement of new Plan B COVID uh, restrictions. I mean, let's start with the party first. Ella, I mean, cast your mind back to December 2020. London is in tier three. It's illegal to meet people from outside of your household indoors. And yet Downing Street, the people supposedly in charge of these rules, who came up with these rules, who want them to be enforced, are having a party. I mean, what the hell is that all about? It's quite difficult to get your head around, but it's also I'm torn on it. Um, mm. Because on the one hand, you th most normal people think, no, it wasn't completely out of the realms of acceptability to have some form of party then, you know, civil servants or whoever it was, spads and aides working in 10 Downing Street have got their laptops open, shut their laptops and infamously pick up some cheese and wine and talk a bit, you know, who cares? And the kind of, I think the zealotry of the pro lockdown response to that has has irked me as it has mm. done, as it has done to us throughout the 20 months of the pandemic. However, these are the people who were the zealot the zealots. These are the people who were going on, um, who were either briefing ministers to go on or going on themselves into press releases, briefing journalists saying very extreme things like you will be arrested if you go and meet your family. Um, you are you know, very much hammering home the narrative of you are killing granny yeah. if you go and see your granny, um, putting the kind of blame and guilt on people, guilt tripping a nation. And then, you know, obviously to watch I, I think that, you know, whether or not you like Alleg Allegra Stratton, um, her being the full guy for this is probably letting too many people off the hook. But the kind of utter contempt for which she was sort mm -hmm. of smirking and giggling, um, you know, this is a press officer that gets paid eye-watering sums to have never done a press <laughs> conference or press briefing other than the one in which she's giggling and laughing at the nation is pretty disgusting. It, I think off the back of all the things that we've had over the last month really, the sleaze allegations, the cronyism within government to then, you know, have it laid out bare from different sources and different videos now that most people in 10 Downing Street, whether or not Boris Johnson knew about it or not, were basically taking the piss. Yeah. yeah. Does make you think, I think the most important thing is it makes you think, uh, you know, these people aren't to be trusted. And most crucially to then now, I'm sure we'll get on to talk about this, to now bring in further restrictions, you think this is more going more than taking the piss. This is actually an insult. Yeah, in a, I mean, you know, they're, they're laughing at the idea of a party while yeah, in private, while publicly, you know, putting on this very brave and strict face. Mm. I mean, it's obviously not even close to the first scandal of its type. We've had the Neil Ferguson scandal within the few week, first few weeks of the first lockdown. We had the Dominic Cummings scandal, of course. I mean, is there a sense that actually, you know, the people in charge never really believed in the rules as much as they let on or, you know, or a sense that the rules maybe are for li the little people, not for us. I mean, what do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's really irked me the most about this is just the fundamental refusal to take any responsibility. So I think mm. that there was um, a, an MP or a minister in an interview saying that, I don't know if it happened, but if it did happen, then I've been guaranteed that the rules weren't broken. So it's this <laughs> kind of slippery, slidey, just refusal to just think if you speak in a certain way, if you kind of avoid it, you never have to be held accountable. And I, I agree with that. Like, I mean, ordinarily, I wouldn't have a problem with mm. people having a party, but it's also this sense that a year down the line, we are still going through these restrictions. We're still being constrained. We're still being regulated. Meanwhile, even a year ago, they weren't following it. Well, and therefore now we're still having to be subject to these same restrictions, if not even increasingly further. So I think to me, it is this, is this slippery refusal to take responsibility um, that I think just reflects on this wider um, insulation that I think that the coronavirus restrictions have given people in power away yeah. from actually any accountability, which is then compounded by the fact that there's a seemingly no opposition. Yeah, I mean, because one of the things that the restrictions, one of the clear effects it's had has been to kind of shut down democracy. Mm. And it has certainly shielded them from public opinion, those kind of normal interactions. I mean, Parliament was shut down for a very long time. Not that most MPs are any good on this on this question, but you know what I mean? I mean, Ella, is that not 
one of the problems. There seems to be a refusal to face up to the fact that, you know, they've destroyed community life mm, yeah. in, in, a, in a big way. We had the refusal to take votes on further coronavirus restrictions happening. You know, uh, the Speaker of the House at the time laughing about the fact that the House was not minded. Oh, you know, haha, we've had enough of this. Just pass the law, you yeah. know, whatever, extend the law. All of that, there's the completely blasé uh, nature in which legislation is passed and, and law is nodded through. But just because there has been no pressure. And I think this is where you have to really point the finger of blame at the Labour Party. Mm. Because in a democracy, an opposition is meant to be there in order to reflect the, you know, the views of a certain section of the population that didn't vote for the Conservatives, you know, of which there is a significant um, section. And I'm sure many people who did vote for the Conservatives in the last general election are now wishing they'd torn up their ballot papers looking yeah. at how they've responded to the pandemic. But the fact that Keir Starmer is literally either on his knees or with his head halfway up Boris Johnson's backside, no matter what he does with the kind of pomp and bluster in PMQs, he consistently, like a nodding dog, just agrees to um, every single coronavirus restriction. And it leaves us shouting at the telly because yeah. what else can we do? Mm -hmm. Well, alongside um, Labour acquiescing to everything there's been the media i mean gb news is slightly different <laughs> but they weren't around at the beginning of the pandemic i mean what have you made of that kind of media acquiescence to all of the all of the restrictions and no, to absolutely the government i mean that, that that's been a consistent theme since the beginning it's never been you know is this really working the way that we're going it's always been has to fight a stronger mm. lockdown and i think that you know that that means that there isn't really an opposition there isn't proper scrutiny and we've only had these tory backbenchers who make up a very small proportion um, of the members of parliament i'm criticizing i think that was on a news slide I, I was watching um on on wednesday actually similar as you said that the labor party mp on there was saying they were going to vote for the restrictions the the tory back backbencher was saying that actually you know this is unacceptable you know having potentially vaccine passports going into parliament and so actually you've got the labor party following through with the government yeah. and they're in backbenchers as the opposition I mean, that's just not how it's going to work. And it's compounded by a media who just looks the other way or supports further restrictions. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a bit more specifically about the new restrictions. So Plan B is official. It's been announced um, this week. So we're going to have, you know, more masks in indoor places. We're going to have vaccine passports for clubs and other kinds of large venues. And lots of people are going to be working from home as well, which is, you know, much more significant than people seem to to let on. I mean. Is there any real justification for this? None. No, there, there genuinely really isn't. In fact, actually, um, Mark Fish, who's a Tory um, uh, MP for Yeovil, was on Radio 4 this morning, giving it to uh, Martha Carney to guns, which was really good to hear, saying if you look at the data, either coming out of South Africa from people who are investigating this, scientists who are investigating this, or indeed the levels of testing that's going on in the UK, you can, he, he made the point that you can pick specific data points and come up with the figure, like Boris Johnson did, and that has been repeated all over the media this morning, that the, the virus could be doubling every one to two days. Mm. And in fact, then a, a, a professor came on later on in the show and said that word could is mm. so important because the difference between it doing it one to two days and four to five days is just, it's different planets. It's yeah, completely yeah. different. And yet yeah. that word could gets completely downplayed and in and what you have is this idea that omicron is here it's we're replaying the delta variant or the count variant or any of these other ones that we had before the vaccine it's all systems go the world's going to end lockdown that is the sentiment that's what you feel as the message is coming from government but when you look at the data and you don't even have to do a deep dive into yeah. it and pretend to be an epidemiologist you look at the levels of vaccination rates you listen to the top lines of what of scientists are saying across the world about the fact that as of yet omicron does not look like it's going to be any deadlier that we don't have the data and there's just this there's all of this is based on a safety first approach yeah. mm. now in a different situation in uh, in you know March of this year, or even maybe in May of this year, you, we might have sat there and said the safety first approach has its place because the vaccine rollout hasn't gone so far. But as we've said as no ad nauseum on this podcast, the fact that you have such high vaccination rates in this country, the fact that you have vaccination rollout program going on across the world, this just is not reasonable anymore. And I'm sure we can talk about this, but the cost of uh, the uh, restrictions, whether they you know the suggestion that 
new mask wearing comes in or a few vaccine passports, it's made to sound like it's, you know, plan B is just a little bit soft. It's just, yeah, you know, yeah. tighten up here or there. What it will mean is that everyone cancels their Christmas party. All the pubs go into crisis. You know, people start thinking, do I need to buy, you know, temperature guns? It's costs, cost, cost to everyone. And it's also just misery. We forget yeah. that the informal misery of watching these people on, you know, Boris Johnson get up on a press release again at six o'clock and your heart just sinks. And yeah. it's just, yeah. <laughs> it's terrible. Yeah. Well, it, would, it, it almost would have been just as bad had he not introduced it, because the fact is, we now, we're now trapped in this place where uh, the next few months of our lives are going to be determined at a government press conference. Yeah. And we always have that hanging over us. I mean, it's, it's dreadful, isn't it? No, I agree. And I think that that point that you touched upon, Ella, is really important. I think that I don't know why it hasn't fully cut through. I mean, I'm sure there's many different reasons for it, but that moral argument against what we're doing, I think yeah. is really powerful. And I do think that the data argument is important as well. We know that vaccine passports in Scotland and Wales haven't made a transformational impact as they're posed. Um, but actually this moral argument about the immiseration of society, the, the kind of constraining of ordinary life, that this idea, you know, children's uh, nativity plays being cancelled, all of these little things that actually make life worth living and yeah. meaningful are just being completely sucked out. And obviously I don't want to give a kind of reverse scare story, but I do think that moral case about what constitutes actually a life worth living, I think does need to be put much back, much back into the, the forefront of the public conversation. Yeah, definitely. And do you think also just, just finally, um, we've touched on this in the past few weeks, um, cause we've seen what's happening in Europe where they're, they're having sort of lockdowns for the unvaccinated, uh, mandatory vaccination in some countries. And, and Boris at the press conference this week refused to rule out mandatory vaccination. He said, he said it's a national conversation that needs to be had. I mean, there is a slippery slope, isn't there, going on here, especially with vaccine passports in particular. And they're slippery bastards. I mean, the, these are politicians who categorically at the start of this year said, you know, Nat, Nadine Zahawi and others said, we will not have coronavirus uh, vaccine passports. Yeah. No way. You know, Boris Johnson, I'm Mr. Liberty. No way. Cut up the, you know, I'll cut up the pass if I have it. And here we are, you know, hop, skip and a jump. And here we are. So it, it, I don't think it makes you a conspiracy theorist or indeed a sort of scaremongering panicker, mm. is, you know, to suggest that. It wouldn't surprise me because, yeah. and not because I think that the government has this master plan to crack us down no. in a kind of authoritarian way, but because it's people have been talking about plan B being brought in as a dead cat strategy in relation to, you know, distracting from the party scenario, Afghanistan scenario, all the stuff that's happening at the moment. This is a government that's flailing yeah. and, and that's what's, that's what makes it dangerous. A yeah. flailing government with no opposition anything could happen. It's frustrating because even just saying that, you know, you're against vaccine mandate. I mean, what I was listening to a, a journalist talking about it being libertarian to oppose um, vaccine mandates. I mean, yeah. and this idea that if I say that or anyone says that they oppose vaccine mandates, that that must suggest that they have to, that they're libertarian. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being libertarian, but just opposing vaccine mandates is something, you know, that most people up until six months ago, if not a few weeks ago, would have widely agreed. And I think that we're past the point in Slippery Slope, that when the Prime Minister Minister is essentially saying that um, we have to have a conversation or it's a completely reasonable conversation in open and free democracy to um, mandate people have a vaccine. I think that that's just a complete abdication of responsibility and, cons and saying that you've lost the argument, that you yeah. can't persuade people, you can't make the case that the only thing that you can do is actually force people. I think that's that's incredibly sad. Given that it's the easiest argument in the world to make, to take this vaccine that could literally keep you out of hospital or save your life in some cases, and their failure to make it is really, really shocking. No, absolutely. And I and I, I, I think it's really unfortunate that we are in this situation now. And I think, you know, when you, when you see what's happening in Europe, I think, you know, I, I went to Amsterdam a few weeks ago and it really is now a show your paper society. I mean, now it's in lockdown, but I had to show three different documents just mm. to get into a gig. I mean, that's just not a kind of society you want to go for. And then if we're going to go further and say that people are going to be mandated, then I think that that slippery slope has really just passed. You're watching the Spiked podcast. I hope you don't mind if I just grab a few seconds of your time to deliver a quick Christmas message. Please, please consider digging deep for Spiked this Christmas. Spiked is free and we always will be. We want as many people as possible to read us, to listen to our podcasts and to watch our videos. And if you enjoy our pro-freedom, pro-democracy and very anti-woke journalism, then surely you want others to enjoy that too. 
It's only through your donations that Spiked is able to keep going and growing. So please consider making a Christmas donation today. Anything you give will be appreciated, but there are also some special perks if you give five pounds or more per month or 50 pounds or more per year, because that will allow you to become a Spiked supporter. Spike supporters get free or discounted tickets to all of our events. You get the right to comment on articles. You can bookmark articles as you browse and much more besides. So please make a Christmas donation today. You can do that really easily by going to spiked-online.com forward slash donate. That's spiked-online.com forward slash donate. Thank you. And now back to the show. So also this week, a whistleblower at the Foreign Office has revealed some of the damning failures that contributed to the botched uh, withdrawal of Afghanistan. Uh, Raphael Marshall has painted a picture of a Foreign Office in total disarray, you know, completely bureaucratic mess with 5,000 emails unanswered at any one time, even when they have subject lines like, please save my children. He estimates that only 5% of the Afghans who asked for assistance were able to be helped. And there are many people left behind um, who will have almost certainly been murdered by the Taliban as a result. And yet at the same time, there is a sense that the Foreign Office really wasn't doing its job. People were kind of working at a, at a punch clock pace, uh, leaving it, you know, after eight hours, working from home. I mean, what does that tell us about, you know, the Foreign Office in particular, but also, I mean, the state more broadly. Yeah, well, Brendan O'Neill made the point in his article this week that, you know, as much as the party might have pissed people off, this screw up at the Foreign Office killed people. Quite, yeah. Quite literally. The um, bunk, whatever we think about the whether or not the West had the right to be in involved in Afghanistan um, or not, and, you know, at Spiked, we don't think they had a legitimate place there. But the with the nature of the withdrawal is indisputably was indisputably yeah. horrendous. The fact that it was so badly mishandled is revealed in Raphael's whistleblowing, in which he, de you know, as you say, he details what was going on there. But also the fact that, you know, the the kind of degradation of the foreign office as a place to work. It used to be for right or wrongly, the pinnacle of someone's career. You know, mm. if you got to be, have a position in the foreign office, you were made, that was it. It was meant to be something that you had. Okay, there was a lot of kind of um, nonsense that went on with it in terms of political prestige, but also it was meant to be sort of vocational. And as yeah. Brendan mentions this word, it was is meant to be a place where you felt like you really were making a difference mm. in the world, or at least that's what British the British establishment told itself. Yeah. And then you hear that they have had things like encouraging their staff to um, take days off, to clock out, to switch off, to you know, and have good mental health. In the abstract, that's fine. We don't like overpressing workers. But in a situation of emergency, where yeah. your job is is involved in literally saving lives and rectifying a wrong that the British establishment has done in Afghanistan, and it's directly the fault of the Foreign Office that these people are are suffering then you stay there until you get the job done. Yeah. You hire more people, you do what needs to be done. Brendan points out that three of the top ministers were on holiday. Dominic Raag was, you know, sunning himself in Crete. You had yeah. all these different um, officials who basically didn't think that this was a big deal. And um, the Guardian's reported today that there are still hundreds of people literally in Kabul hiding uh, in sheds and stuff, women who were teachers, people who were English translators, who if they are found will be killed by the Taliban because they were promoting British values and were employed by the British state. This is, it's horrendous. And, you know, like we were saying about the party, that's one thing, but yeah. this is, this should be making the front pages. No, it's extraordinary. I mean, can you really run the foreign office working from home it's just nonsense isn't it no exactly and i think that it really does reveal some of the uh uh, huge drawbacks of these this bureaucratic infrastructure. You you lose this sense of urgency. You mm. lose this sense of the the humanity, this humane sense that comes with actually this full sense of responsibility that you have, particularly when you're actually working together about something that's incredibly important. So kind of working from home, seeing lots and lots of emails, you can kind of clock out at, at any time that you want. There yeah. isn't this kind of sense of 
responsibility or accountability or solidarity mm. um, that you can you would ordinarily have in other situations. And I think you're totally right. I mean, the the foreign office or becoming the foreign secretary was positioned as one of the great offices of state, whereas now it doesn't seem to have that sense of prestige. And what happened during the Afghanistan um, the horrendous uh, withdrawal that happened with Afghanistan, you know, someone the, the foreign secretary Dominic Raab being on holiday, yeah. no sense of urgency there. And I think I think I think it's just another demonstration about the the way in which many uh, institutions within our country are being degraded without a sense of clear moral purpose. One of the um, other really shocking revelations um, to come from this whistleblower was that essentially the evacuation of animals was prioritised over the evacuation of humans. So the, these were the animals of the Nowzad charity um, run by Penn Farthing. And, you know, this whistleblower has no doubt that human that li human lives were put at risk as a result of this. I mean, what does that say about this government, about so our society? I mean, it's just crazy and depraved, isn't it? It's disgusting. And it's uh, not only that, it's the allegation at the moment that the charity, in, in which actually the charity has uh, said that it went through Carrie Johnson and mm. used connections that, you know, Boris Johnson's wife um, to go through Carrie to get Boris to get the sign off to push this as a priority to get Pen Farthing his wish to fill a plane full of dogs and animals while people were, at, you know, t to rewind back our minds because, you know, it's not exactly been a huge amount of time since it happened, but news moves so quickly. People were queuing in open sewage, were being shot at, were being, you know, Kabul Airport was a complete horror mm. um, for days on end and a plane was commandeered at the at the whisper of um you know the person who's now become known as Carrie Antoinette that's an <laughs> allegation at the moment mm. but the whole what we've been just been talking about the nature of the foreign office not working properly not having a kind of moral compass um would would suggest that it would make it easy for these th these interventions to take place i think it also tells you something more broadly about the nature of british intervention in the west because you know before you know before the withdrawal the way in which um western powers and the UK has been bad, you know, Britain has been bad at this for years, have used the citizens of places like Iraq, like Syria, um, like in Kabul and Afghanistan as, you know, as pawns, as people where state, you know, th stages where, um, you know, foreign politics plays out, who are just kind of people who are either fodder in, in wars between powers or they're people who are used to garner Western um, authority. So, you know, all the little girls in Af you know, everybody's now talking about women and girls in Afghanistan, but they don't really care about women and girls in Afghanistan. They actually just want to be seen to be doing a nice thing. So in that context, when people aren't really seen as citizens of a nation with the same rights and priorities and solidarity as we in our country, it doesn't, it's not unsurprising that then they get sacrificed for animals, for dogs. That tells you something about the nature of Western intervention and the value they actually have put for years on the citizens living in those countries. Let's talk a bit about um, the latest Rod Little scandal. Um, I say that not because there's been one recently, but because he is fond of causing controversy. Uh, so he spoke at Durham University uh, on Friday night. He he made a few jokes, one of them being he was disappointed to see so no sex workers at the event referencing uh, Durham University giving a, a training course to um, help student sex workers. Since then, there's been an enormous fallout. Um, students walked out of the event itself. Uh, Tim Luckhurst, the head of South College in Durham, who invited Rod, called those students pathetic. He's since had to withdraw his remarks and is under investigation. I mean, this is just a classic campus censorship story, isn't it, Anaya? I mean, 400 students uh, protested in the last couple of days at Durham to calling for him to be sacked. So it, it is something that could potentially escalate quite um, significantly. But I think there's many layers to this. I mean, I obviously, as someone that supports free speech and has kind of argued against the kind of campus free speech censorship and all of the things that are going on, I do also wonder with with um, Tim Luckhurst in the sense of what he was expecting, in the mm. sense that um, we know what the whole discourse around students are like and we know that there is controversy around Rod Liddell for whatever reason and I do wonder if he just 
what his rationale was. Now, I think there could be a genuinely interesting point to be made uh, about tolerance. And I yeah. think that the way in which actually tolerance means tolerating people that you fundamentally disagree with. But I think there was a sense of unpreparedness for the fallout. And I think that as people that want to uh, reorient campus life to be much more invigorating around them, um, intellectual exchange and so on. I think that we perhaps have to be able to think of much more, uh, much more productive ways or ways in which are going to acknowledge the reality of the way that students, unfortunately, right now behave. And so essentially inviting Rod Little, the students predictably, you know, <laughs> for, walk out, yeah. calling them pathetic, and then they call for him to be sat. It's almost like the the perfect example of what tends to happen. So I yeah. don't know if there's another way that that could have been or, handled. Or what not to do if you want to get Rod Little back to, <laughs> for, another, for another round. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Ella, it's quite interesting that, you know, obviously, as as ever, people deny that there is a problem of censorship on cam uh, on campus. So when this story first broke, people were very keen to say, "Well, walking out is not campus censorship." But then almost immediately, you get the petitions, you get the yeah. calls for you know Tim Luckhurst to be sacked. The event is being investigated by the university, and it, you know it spirals out of control. Yeah, it really didn't take long for it to be for people to be able to say, oh, well, walking out is just an exercise of your free speech. And then actually the clampdown comes. Yeah, well, as I nice says, it's, it was, it's a perfect parody because you have both sides. No, it is not cancel culture for people to walk out. There's many times that I've walked out of either crap comedy nights or because I need a wee in the middle of the cinema. <laughs> so I, you know, walking out, you, you are not obligated to, yeah. and this was a, the mistake that Tim Luck has made was, and Rod Little actually made a statement afterwards saying, you have to listen to these views if you're on your university. Now we say that students should have mm. to do these things, that it should be not a requirement officially, but that you should want to. But no, you don't have to. And if you put on, you know, you put on a speaker and uh, half the audience work walks out, well, that sucks for you. You mm. speak to the man and the dog that's left in the front row. But the fact that then you know, instead of having a, what would be a healthy campus culture yeah. would be that people walk out, you say, oh, you're, you know, Tim Luckers, whoever says you're worse for walking out, you're pathetic. And the students say, oh, well, shut up. And you have a debate and you have a row, maybe it's not exactly, uh, you know, civil natured, but that it's the rough and tumble of the university. Mm -hmm. It's all informal. That's what happens. Maybe the students put on another event uh, tomorrow. Maybe they invite Rod Little back and get one of their own speakers to combat him. But instead it ends up in this, Really, you know, the word pathetic is right. This mm. pathetic mm. sort of legalistic kind of minis like technocratic way of saying, well, I'll petition you and I'll get you sacked and you have to, and everyone ends up admit, you know, it, uh, administering apologies that they don't believe in, that yeah. no one believes that they believe in. And it's just also false. And what you really want to do is get down there and knock heads together and say, you hold your stupid event if you want to, and you don't go to it and mm. then just leave each other alone or better yet, have a, <laughs> you know, have a row. But both students and I think faculty at universities have become so brittle around the issue of free speech. Yeah. That I think the point you make about having to come up with innovative ways to try and get around that, to get people to come to the table, is probably the way forward rather than continuously poking the bear. It's just insane how the, the first response now is to get somebody sacked. Yeah. As you mentioned, it's not, let's have a discussion about this. Let's have a, an alternative event. It is that actually we, we are entitled to remove you permanently from the campus. And I think that that absolutely is where the right word is council culture. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's, it's always, I feel unsafe. That's mm -hmm. hate speech. Mm -hmm. It's it's not, I disagree with you. Mm -hmm. It's an attempt to end the argument rather than carrying it on. Finally, let's talk about Hillary Clinton. Uh, she's clearly still not over her loss in 2016. Uh, this week, a video was released, it's a, a hilarious video was released of her reading the speech that she would have given had she won. I mean, she, what is going on here? I mean, she just has this sense of entitlement, doesn't she? I mean, she she was nearly crying in the video. I think she might have actually been yeah. crying. Yeah. She squeezed out a few tears, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it is really interesting, you know, in the whole context that um, society have been having about some of the things going on in America with the way in which the Republicans have are in this hole because Trump is insisting that the, the election um, was rigged. And I think that is obviously completely ridiculous and should be strongly condemned. But I think that the, the seas for that whole 
thing has been sown even much before that. I yeah. mean, even Hillary Clinton, when she lost the election in 2016, you know, she instantly was saying that it was likely to do with kind of Russian meddling. Then they spent four years uh, trying to prove that 2016 was to do with, you know, a, a Russia hoax and all things like that. There is this growing uh, desire to actually cast out on an election and say that you're entitled to have a particular position, um, you know, running society rather than making the case, mm. winning um, the argument democratically. And, and that's your justification for being in that position, not because you're entitled to be there. Yeah. Ella. But also the fact that this was part of, she was doing a masterclass, which mm. is this series that, you know, you get celebrities or you know, sh people with talents, like a chef or a photographer or, you know, an actor or something that teaches you their, what they they can give a masterclass in. And the fact that she was giving a masterclass in her leadership <laughs> skills. Yeah. And you just think, hang on a minute, as someone who categorically lost one of the most high profile elections of the 21st century, you have some goal getting up here mm. and saying that you have some mm. wisdom to impart here. It, you know, it is, it really quite perfectly encapsulates exactly why she lost mm. yeah. because she is the establishment figure that oozes the self-entitlement, that kind of, don't you know who I am? I am, uh, this was, I was my birthright. In fact, in that video, she's crying and she says, I was supposed to tell my mother that her little girl would grow up to be the president. So, yeah. well, sorry, you didn't because that pesky lot, the population of voting mm. public mm. got in your way. And, you know, as you know, I think you make a really key point, which is that the idea that everything that's wrong with America at the moment, and there's a lot wrong with America at the moment, happened because the big blonde fool Donald Trump came in and screwed everything up and everything was perfect beforehand, is a complete mismatch from reality. Hillary Clinton should know by now that the reason she lost wasn't because Donald Trump was such a superstar, but because she was riding on the back of a serious amount of discontent mm -hmm. with what the Clintons represented in terms of a corrupt establishment within America. And so, but you know, this is what the establishment does. They are completely blind to their own failures. I mean, what was she going to do? Go away and say, okay, I'll just be quiet on my farm somewhere. And you know, like yeah. me and Bill will be have, have tea for the rest of our life. No, she's going to cap try and capitalize off her celebrity and we should not take her seriously. Yeah, and, and I think it also just demonstrates that you know, five years down the line, not much has been learned from many either her supporters or, or, or many people like her. And I think that, you know, many of the the things, as you rightfully mentioned, that sowed the seeds for Donald Trump's um, rise in 2016 seem to still be there, if not much worse. And yeah. I think that, you know, America deserves much better. American people deserve much better than this um, entitled elite that think they're kind of born to rule and don't need to make the democratic case. And, and whatever madness the Republicans are going through right now, I think the American people deserve much more. Thank you so much for watching the Spikes podcast. We'll be back next Friday. If you hit subscribe and click the bell, you'll never miss an episode. And in the meantime, why not check out all of Spikes' other videos and podcasts on this channel? And for more Spiked content, find us at spiked-online.com.